So yeah, I'm Byron Cochran, and uh, the company that we have is called uh, OpenWork, OpenWork Limited. Adrian's a partner in that company as well, and another spatial uh, guru, standards guru in uh, New Zealand is also affiliated with that, and that's uh, Richard Murcott, who's not here today. Uh, he's more on the ISO side and more on the OGC side. And I'm here to talk about open standards and metadata. That's what my life's about, so that makes me a fun <laughs> guy, right? But really what this is about is, uh, in, in summary, is that it's about doing better documentation for standards leading to better open source products. So open, source, open standards are behind a lot of open source geospatial products, especially standards from the OGC. GeoServer was developed to deliver WFS services and uh, 52 North uh, developed their products to this to deliver sensor observation services, both OGC standards. And, um, but today I'm gonna to be mostly talking about metadata and catalogs, and especially the new metadata standard, ISO 19115-1. Of the products listed here, only one of them currently supports that new standard, even though it's been out for many years, and that's GeoNetwork. The others either support older versions of the standard, or they support other standards. And there's other standards out there besides the ISO family there that uh, do support uh, spatial, but not as, uh, as robustly. The ISO family is the most comprehensive and complete of those tools uh, for capturing metadata. And the latest ones, the uh, Dash 1, Dash 2, Dash 3, uh, are revisions since 2014 and are now the endorsed standards through ANSLIC and ICSM and such, the, the regional bodies and that uh, make decisions on such things. Uh, and so Dublin Core is mostly for discovery. Schema.org allows search engines to crawl the web and find your data. But they don't do a whole lot more than that. And then I should say something about DCAT, which is an RDF linked data friendly format. A new revision of that is about to be released that should be able to cover most of the stuff in ISO 19115-1. But uh, that's for another conversation. How do I get out of that? Escape. Okay. Use that. So, yeah, this is some work I did with ANSLIC and ICSM, the regional bodies. And what we wanted to do was create some best practices for metadata elements. There's definitions in the standards, but the definitions are a little too vague for us to get what we need. So this is for when simple definitions just won't do. The problem uh, was varied. Uh, yeah, the problem was there. I did not mean for it to come across that way. The problem was different on both sides of the, the Tasman Sea. In New Zealand, where not many people really use GeoNetwork, they couldn't actually use the new standard, but yet we had retired the old one. So what do we do? We kind of say, uh, wait for it to come, we'll see. In Australia, the situation was different because they used GeoNetwork much more extensively there, and a lot of agencies had moved to the new standards but not consistently. So they, had, they were populating metadata records. The same data may be in different elements or they're using an element to hold different data. Doesn't help much for sharing of data going forward. So uh, we've reformed the metadata working group that was a uh, part of ANSLIC many years ago and uh, reconstituted it with uh, support, particularly from GA to say, yes, we'll keep this going for many years and provide the needed support, which is really, really important. And uh, we aimed at creating some guidance that would uh, give people some idea of what elements to use, when to use them, and how to use them. We started by looking at what people were already doing. So, and uh, the leaders in this effort were Geoscience Australia again. Of course, ABARS and Australian Antarctic Division and others had done a fair amount too. So comparing their profiles, uh, the small p profiles, we didn't want to have a capital P profile that we had to really maintain, remember. Uh, just their individual use of it led us to uh, a start at guidance. The other place we looked for guidance was the problems that uh, places like uh, data.gov.au were having on harvesting the metadata. So that's where the kind of it, the rub would really come, is when you're trying to take metadata out of one standard and bring it into another. And if everyone's not using that standard the same way, you get all sorts of problems. So yeah, better guidance was needed for consistent use. That was the conclusion of that. Our template for the documentation we chose was something pattern language, if anyone's familiar with that. 
Uh, I had used it recently in some work I did with the W3C on spatial data on the web. Data on the web used the same pattern and uh, several others in, that, in, that, uh, in the W3C as well. Some of you may recognize pattern language from the uh, Design Patterns book for object-oriented programming by the Gang of Four. It was a kind of a Bible textbook for a long, long time uh, for people learning that, that technology. But where I first came across it was the original, the Christopher L. Alexander, who's an architect from Berkeley, California, came up with this idea in the late 70s. In order to promote good design, he documented the patterns that led to good design so they could be better used, better understood, and uh, not half-assed done, essentially. So that's essentially what we were trying to do with these metadata elements. To start to gather all the elements, we moved to an open source platform called Lumio, some of you may be familiar with. It's for collaboration. And uh, it served its purpose. We didn't get the interaction we wanted, but what we did get was a visibility and enough input to make the decision making that uh, we had had going on with face-to-face -face meetings and, on, and uh, bi-weekly uh, teleconferences and such. It augmented that tremendously and let us move forward much faster plus a certain amount of my dedicated time, so not everyone was just doing it in their spare time. It also provided us markdown support, so the documentation we made was easy to translate into other formats as well. But that only got us so far. Once we got the main content into Lumio, we moved to GitHub. GitHub to support the versioning and to give us a, um, the Git side of it, and that versioning support and being able to fork and all that stuff. But GitHub also provides some wikis and most importantly for us, the GitHub pages that made, gave us a ready-to-use presentation uh, view of our resource. Uh, the forking was really important for future use, but the, one of the main things uh, that it gave us was a well-known platform that most agencies have at least several people now who know how to use Git and GitHub, so it didn't scare the, the agencies much on moving to that platform. Probably less than Lumio, actually. But Lumio is a lot easier to use. So um, the document, yeah, it's in three formats, essentially, I guess you could say. The raw markdown stuff, which can be really useful to get to if you want to drill to just one element, uh, one part of one element def uh, definition. Or we have the GitHub pages and a PDF version, because, well, some people like it that way. I don't find it that much use, but. Let's see, yes, I have a mouse, good. So I'd like to take a look at it now and just kind of show you what, what it looks like. So, yeah, introduction. Where's my picture? Huh, yeah. that's kind of strange. Yeah. Slow. Just okay, you'll probably come in. Anyway, it's <laughs> got a picture of all of us on the top there. Just imagine it, you know, a group <laughs> of us looking up and smiling. A lot of well-known faces from the geospatial community in Australia. You might recognize Simon Cox, people like that. Uh, and we start with this definition, or this introduction, and it's followed by a table of contents, which is kind of just standard stuff. Oops, where's my mouse? There it goes. And uh, what I want to say about the, this list of elements that we're using, and it's not a full comprehensive description of all the metadata elements in the standards. Uh, a standard like this, you kind of have to think of as both a dictionary and rules of grammar. You can say what you want to say without having to use a whole damn dictionary, you know? So that's, that's what that's uh, set up as. It's just as kind of a pick and choose. But in order to show what it really looks like, I think it's good to just jump into one of the elements here. I don't like this mouse pad very well. Let's see, metadata identifier, that's a good one to start with. And uh, yeah, it's kind of strange, this browser's not showing the image. But every uh, element has this kind of handle we put on it, some uni unique within its own space sort of name that we give it. Metadata identifier, that's it's straightforward enough, kind of can get an idea of what that is. And it's got five stars on it because it's, it's a high priority item, high uh, importance in our, in our mind from the ICSM. And it has a description underneath of it that's uh, really easy to kind of get a handle on. Oh, well, what's this thing about? And it's in order for people to distinguish a metadata record from all other metadata records, you need a unique identifier. Well, that's straightforward enough. 
And then the next section down describes where it lies in the record, the path, and the governance. Governance is an interesting one because a lot of metadata fields can be governed at either the agency or the domain level. It'll vary between domains on what you really need to capture in a metadata record after all. And, uh, but this one, it's at a higher level. It's at ICSM. They, they're kind of saying everyone in Australia, New Zealand region should populate this as, as our guidance shows down below. What it's useful for, so we have that's for linkage and identification and then it's audience. Which is a uh, uh, poor personas, machine to machine, uh, general audience. They don't have as much need for it. Machine to machine, yeah, they, they that's very important for machine to machine. Not that useful to a general user. Data manager might want to see this to make sure one metadata record is different from another, and so might a specialist. We have metadata type there, and that's just kind of is it administrative, descriptive, or structural, just kind of a general categorization. And finally, an important one is ICSM level of agreement. This is kind of a living document. You know, we haven't, we couldn't come to full agreement on how every one of these may be used because often there's outstanding issues, as there is with this one, as you'll see down the page briefly. I won't get into what the issues are, it's too complicated, but. Uh, then the definition, which is essentially an in-context definition from ISO. The problem with ISO definitions is that this, uh, this identifier element can be used in many, many places throughout the record. So you get a definition for just that, and so it's not in context. So we put it in context. So it's, the, for the, it's a persistent alphanumeric identif alpha identifier is basically all you get in the ISO de definition. But where it sits in the standard, it's for the metadata record that describes a resource. So that just gives it a context. We have the ISO obligation and the R recommendations above that. It's optional in ISO. We say it should be populated. And uh, recommended uh, sub-elements underneath. So as I said, uh, and, and it showed up above, that this element is actually not just one field. It's, uh, it's a class MD identifier that appears many places in the metadata record. But for this particular use, these are the three most important sub-elements that you should, uh, you should use. The discussion just kind of goes into how we came to the decisions we made here and shows outstanding issues. Uh, crosswalk considerations. Wow. That's kind of a weird browser, isn't it? Oops. Because it doesn't hide that. Uh, anyway. Recommendations is just kind of a verbal way of summarizing a lot of the ICSM recommendations at the end. The crosswalk considerations, if I'm pulling in from an old metadata record, what do I have to watch out for? If I'm mapping out to another standard like Dublin Core, DCAT, or whatever, then what should, I, what should I watch out for? Where's my mouse? There we are. And this section, also consider, this is from the original, I don't know if they had this in uh, the object-oriented programming book, yeah, but I think they did. They did. But this basically points you to other patterns that you might be interested in. So resource identifier, it, it might be one if you're, the metadata identifier is for the metadata. The resource identifier is for the resource and those things can get mixed up. This happens a lot, you know, like in, uh, like in uh, licensing. Is it the license for the metadata or license for the resource? So this sort of information is captured here. Finally, I close with some examples and a UML diagram. So that's, uh, Basically just, uh, let's see, now get back to the presentation. That's essentially all it is, oops. Right there, cool. So yeah, the use and usability. We went through after this uh, first draft is done and trying to figure out best how to use it. I wanna focus on how it can be used here to improve software essentially. So. And uh, with the way that's set up in GitHub, forking's really important. You know, we have the ICSM guidance, but Geoscience Australia might have some special guidance that they want for their agencies. Also been approached by OGC who say, yeah, we love this, but we want to strip out the ICSM stuff and make it more generic. So that's cool. Maybe we can have that as a repository for the main stuff, and ICSM can pull down changes from there, you know, normal Git type stuff. And then that would allow, say, the marine data community to have their own guidance document that pulls from, from the OGC one, maybe with some extra marine stuff or depth and whatever else you need in there. 
Uh, but at the bottom here, we have a, an issue of uh, Australian Ocean Data Network, which may want to pull from both the ICSM and the marine data, because it's Australia and it's marine data. So one of the ways that this can be done programmatically is by creating a document then and guidance that links to the appropriate catalog wherever. Uh, or it could be done through Git and very carefully pushing your changes and pulling them down from the right resource and not the wrong one. Embedded help. This is something that's uh, already in Geo Network. Uh, you mouse over type help, but we we like to see this used to expand on this and say, uh, you know, not only get that that short definition, but the longer in context definition, and maybe drill be able to link to more examples and uh, and other discussions about the item. Perhaps a help menu item as well. This could be put into any metadata tool. Uh, but most importantly, we think that this guidance could be used to develop future metadata tools. As I said, GeoNetwork does support this now, but perhaps it could be made better by inclu including in the more of the documentation elements, the help type stuff. Uh, but it's the only one right now. The big one out there that I think needs to be hit is PyCSW and Al's lib that's kind of underneath that. Those libraries are the, the, the bit that provide metadata to Geonode, Coordinates, CCAN, and uh, many others. But right now, they don't have the 115-1 support. It's, and the rest of the world is moving to it now. The FGDC in the US has decided to move there. Inspire in Europe have decided to move there. So this has to happen. They've looked at it a bit, but they don't quite know where to go. I'm trying to figure out how I can get support to get in there and uh, make it worth spending my time to help them do it, because I think I'm pretty well placed. But anyway, that could apply also to the open source Esri Geo Portal um, and any QGIS metadata tools. All these could use this type of help to help them design better tools that understand the, the, what needs to populate these fields and not just the ISO simple descriptions. And again, at the end, proprietary tools. We hope they do too, but that's kind of beyond our, our realm here. So that's basically it. Um, I, that's a really brief introduction to the work we've been doing. But uh, this will be available on the ICSM website or ANSLIC. I don't know if it's quite uh, uh, decided yet and published very soon. As I said, it's a, to be a work in progress. and. Uh, I'll continue to change as uh, we get more and more guidance. I should say right now it's only at data resources and not services, but that again, that's also one of the next steps we're looking at is including services. So. Uh, would we all like to thank Barb? Well, the full team is probably about 50 people, pretty much all from Australia. There hasn't been much uh, New Zealand involvement. I started out uh, involved on Thank behalf you very much of Lynn's, great presentation. and then uh, after, ask, the, after uh, that, uh, how many people just said, hey, uh, maybe you need someone to actually to do the this. grunt work and not everyone around the table, because they weren't making a whole lot of progress at that time. Everyone had their day job, so someone who could be dedicated was really important. But we have a, probably about... 50 people in the group, and most of the meetings gather about 30 to 35 people on face-to-face, -face, very, very active discussions. Uh, I should give a shout out particularly to Everett Blaze, who's, uh, who's really well knowledgeable about these standards, particularly from an ISO perspective, and, but several others, you know, people like Simon Cox and such, who are just, you know, big, huge brains that, that really delve into this stuff deep. So it's been a very active group with a lot of participation, but most of the participation, as I said, wasn't really direct. The Lumio page didn't get that much input, but it did generate enough discussion to get the buy-in.